Oh, boy. Remember, we don't live in fear? I'm with, I'm we don't live in fear. I'm just saying that because that's what I have to say. Well, we've been okay. hugging, so. So well, like us on Facebook me. and leave and read the list of devotionals, and there'll okay, be some for me on it also there. Uh, and uh, Tyler, let Melanie explain. So Melanie, will you um, Actually, it? we are. We're we're not sure we're going to do it. We're having there's a lot of issues with it. I mean, every time I get past one hurdle, it throws me another hurdle. Have we talked and, to anybody that runs Tyler? Well, now they're asking for copies of driver's license, and so Robbie and I are working on okay. working on whether or not it's just going to be the best thing to do because. I did two test runs this week and it didn't accept it and then right. finally accepted it and then they said they were shutting it, they were freezing us because they want photocopies of driver's license yeah. and I'm, I'm just not comfortable no, with that stuff that being either. out there. So, so Robbie and I are other, talking there's about other just... programs, let's find something so it just makes it easier for people to give online. Uh, right now they can still go to our website and put it on PayPal or mail a check the old fashioned way. <laughs> Send it by carrier pigeon. Anyways, praise the Lord, and we're just so thankful that He is still Jesus Christ, the Lord of all. Amen. Amen. Let's worship with the praise team.
plays the sound of the trumpet and he says, I will remember you and I will deliver you from your enemies. He said, Jehovah, Jireh, I am your provider. He has provided the sacrifice for sins and in that sacrifice comes everything to deliver us. From, from finances, from corona, from cancer, from whatever. He said to expect me to deliver you. Blow the trumpet. Sound the alarm. And I will remember you. I am your God. And you are to expect me to come and deliver you. This is my Bible. 
It is the word of God. It never changes so that it will change me. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's look at our scriptures for today. But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent may now lead through his subtlety, your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that come preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if he receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. Father, I pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, give us ears to hear and understand with the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is driving home this point to us and to the Corinthian church, but to the churches of all ages. Father, I pray and ask in the name of Christ, Lord, that you give us eyes to see and ears to hear. And Father, we just thank you and we praise you. And thank you, Lord, for the power and the anointing of your word. And the church said, amen, amen and amen. The title is, Will the Real Jesus Please Stand Up? <laughs> In the 1970s, I used to watch a game show that was titled to, titled to Tell the Truth. Many of you out there will remember that. It ran for from the um, late 50s all the way up to the mid 80s, or, or late 70s, I should say. And then it was, again, broadcasted under new host and kind of a different format. But the object of the game show was for a celebrity panel to a four to determine by questions which of the three contestants were that real person whose name was repeated by the three, with one of them actually being that person. You see, there are false apostles made Paul's uh, person of supreme issue, as you look at today's uh, uh, text there. And they were accusing Paul of being a lesser apostle, not quite fully there, not quite the apostles that they were. They used their craftiness, which means cunningness, shrewdness, uh, that's what subtlety means, a crack, and crap, uh, and the attack on Paul's legitimacy as an apostle. So as you look through uh, Corinthians, see, Paul was defending himself, not because his ego was hurt, but because the work of God was being assailed by the enemy, and Paul made in no uncertain terms he was an apostle, in fact, called out of due season, and if you read that account in Acts, where he actually was called up in the third heaven, and he met the Lord Jesus Christ so that when he went up to the council in Jerusalem, they understood he had been with Jesus just as the 11 other had been because what Paul told them was only those who had personally witnessed, personally seen Jesus, knew that he had come in contact and yes, he was a disciple. And a disciple, by the way, or an apostle that actually gave us the uh, covenant and, the, and fleshed it out and gave us the, and the real meaning of the new and better covenant. So he was, you know, having, uh, uh, but their intent, excuse me, was to establish him as not a true apostle of Jesus Christ or a lesser, lesser one. See, Paul will later say that this is no marvel, for Satan himself at times will transform himself into an angel of light. And that's exactly what he does. False teaching never comes into the church wearing a nice, or should I say, wearing a neon sign or some type of placard that says, beware of what I got to tell you because I'm going to lead you from the gospel. I'm going to lead you from the Jesus Christ of the Bible to follow another Jesus with a warning sign and, and neon lights going off or bells and sirens ringing and proclaiming, I am a false apostle. No, that false apostle, that false teacher, that false preacher will always come into the church with some authority, although it's not authority from God, it's a vested authority that they themselves have accrued. They will come in with uh, enough teaching of the Bible that will make it palatable to swallow the, the poisonous part of their message, to accept that other Jesus, to uh, embrace the workings of another spirit. And this is what has always been the bane of the church, or I should say what the church has always had to be on guard against, even at its inception from the day of Pentecost. So this is the very important to remember. All teaching that is false begins with the presentation of a counterfeit Jesus Christ. Now observe, he that cometh, the first part of verse 4, which is our key text today, for if, if, for if he that cometh, in other words, it's not meant to portray a hypothetical situation, but rather a particular individuals had come into the church of Corinth with 
devious purposes in their mind. That purpose was to gather a following unto themselves. That purpose was to put Paul down and thereby bring in this other gospel that is a gospel that would not save but end up damning those who follow it. This was not only a warning for the church of Paul's day, but is an admonition for the church of all time. And I'm afraid that there's too many preachers who lack discernment or are not bold enough to proclaim there's something wrong with what's going on in this particular movement or at this particular time or this particular place. Where is God's men and women who will stand in the gap and say, if it does not line up with the word of God, do not accept it. Because it is, as Paul said, another Jesus that's presented and empowered by another spirit that presents another gospel. We must keep that in mind today. For there were uh, false prophets in the Old Testament who were sent by Satan. So it is, in the, so it is the same today. And one of Satan's, Satan's greatest weapons against the church of Jesus Christ is and always has been the false teacher, the false prophet, the preacher, the false preacher, whatever label you want to get uh, put on that individual who presents something that is not of the Bible accord, that does not line up with the Word of God, that is not the Jesus Christ that the scripture, Scriptures proclaim who He is. Now note what Paul means by another Jesus. Preacheth another Jesus whom we have not preached. As previously mentioned, this is the main thrust of Satan's deception and always has been. And if another Jesus is preached, then another spirit will be received and another gospel believed. So what does Paul mean by another Jesus? That's a good question to ask, is it not? First of all, Paul always preached Jesus Christ and him crucified and risen again. As the answer for the hurting, dying humanity, he proclaimed, But for God, but <clears throat> God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, but whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Look at Corinthians 6, or Galatians 6.14, please. Let's read it again. I had it in my notes, but I want you to read it for yourself. But God forbid, that's a pretty strong, uh, strong statement, isn't it? That I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Notice he did not glory in uh, 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 the power of God. He did not, uh, per se, he did not glory in anything but what Christ did and the efficacy of giving of himself on that cross 2,000 years ago, the shedding of his blood, that is the message of the gospel that transforms the life of the sinner into the saint and then takes that saint and empowers them to do the works that the Holy Spirit has called them to do in the body of Christ. Amen? We must keep that always in our minds. So to preach Jesus in any other capacity than the crucified, resurrected one is to preach another Jesus. This means that the historical Jesus alone is another Jesus. The Jesus that provides money or just temporary material things as a primary message is another Jesus. In other words, to preach Jesus in any capacity, apart from Calvary, we are presenting another Christ. When you do that, you are presenting a Christ that cannot, will not, and does not demand that you become his disciple. There's a distinction there. Anytime you separate Christ from his finished work as being the centrality message of the gospel, you've got another Jesus. That Jesus will just embrace your lifestyle without bringing you to that juxtaposition of a place where you choose to deny the flesh, walk away from sin, and follow him in totality as the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm afraid what's presented today is a Jesus that does not make or make a demand that you make him Lord of your life. And I'm here to declare to you, if Jesus Christ is not your Lord, he will not stay your Savior, even if you've been saved. And it's not based on works or lack thereof. It's not based on rules and regulations. It's because your faith will eventually move to accommodate your lifestyle and your theology. Your lifestyle, my lifestyle, your theology, my theology, must line up with God's Word. Anything apart from that is another gospel. Right. It's that simple. Amen? Amen? Now, I'm not mad at you, but I am mad at those that present another Jesus Christ. Because people are being lost and damned to hell for eternity because 
they put their faith in another Jesus. See, it's not just Jesus, but rather, as Paul declared in his first epistle to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2. 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 Hmm. We'll have the stoning after church for the minister who works that back there. Amen. I can say that because he's my son. For I determined not to know you, know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's what Paul's talking about. He did not glory, did not desire to know um, all the intricacies and everything, or he didn't desire to know philosophical uh, reasons why we should follow Jesus. He did not desire to know uh, just the power of the Holy Spirit. He desired to know Jesus Christ and him crucified. That was his goal. In other words, the person of Jesus Christ. What he did for Paul personally on that cross. That's what Paul was talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2 there. He says, so I determined not to know anything among you saved. Again, Jesus Christ and him crucified. In other words, Jesus is not an economist, for he is the Savior. Jesus is not uh, a psychologist, for he is the Savior. Jesus is not a doctor. He is the Savior, first and foremost. Jesus is not a sociologist. He is the Savior. Jesus is not a politician. He is the Savior. He is the Savior, and there is no other. There's not another Christ as those that present him. He is Jesus Christ that the scriptures lift up and glorify and magnify and present the one who was the Lamb of God that took away the sin of the world. Amen? He did not accommodate sin. He did not say, okay, I understand your flesh and you struggle. No, because if he could just accept us as we are, he wouldn't have had to go to the cross. But by the way, that's a lie of the enemy. God cannot, listen, you may be mad at me for saying this, but God cannot accept any one of you or me as you were. Oh, that's not true. No, it is. He called you as you were. A sinner destined for destruction and deserving of it. But the love of God was such that he provided a way, that way being Jesus Christ crucified and resurrected again. He provided a way that you and I, that when he called us, our hearts were pricked because we heard the real gospel and opened our hearts up to the real Jesus Christ. And upon doing that, then he accepts us because now we are no longer that sin, uh, that sinful vessel that's fit for destruction. But we are now the house of the Holy Spirit, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And we are a temple that's fit and set aside for the work of God. Amen. Amen. That's been a lie that's been propagated upon the church that he accepts you as you are. Scriptures don't say that. He loved us as we are. Mm -hmm. Because we were sinners and couldn't be anything but that. But he accepts us into his family because now of whose end is Jesus Christ and we have his righteousness. Amen? Mm -hmm. You see, there's a vast difference there. I hope you see that. While all these things are affected in a positive way, that is not the primary purpose, that being salvation of the soul. The Jesus that Paul preached, Christ with him crucified, sets the captive free. It saves souls while at the same time destroying the powers of darkness and breaking the, the power of sin in the life of those that will yield their heart totally to Jesus Christ. You see, man's real problem is sin, and that is the problem Jesus addressed as Savior and did so on the cross. The Christian's greatest fight, then, is the good fight of the faith. You know, too many people misquote that. They say the fight of faith. No, it's not. It's the, it's the, the fight. The good fight of the faith. The being the definite article. Because there's a lot of faith out there. But there's only one faith that saves the sinner. And there's only one faith that empowers and uh, uh, gives victory over sin in the life of the believer. And that's the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. And that faith is... Jesus Christ gave his life for you and shed his blood on that cross. Yes. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. As it's declared in Hebrews. And that means sin, the sin nature, and, and which because of the sin nature is the results, is all the effects and all the fruit of the sin nature are the sins that we commit. 
That's a different message than you hear in most pulpits today. Yes, God is love. His greatest, greatest attribute is love. And it is shown in Jesus Christ. But the percent of Jesus that accepts you as you are. Oh, I know. I know. You got some problems. And that's okay. We'll work on it as we can. Don't be concerned about that. Just have faith in me. That's another Jesus, people. See, that Jesus doesn't say, come follow me. That Jesus said, just praise me. You may think I'm splitting hairs, but I'm not. There's a vast difference there. Because if you're really going to please the Lord and praise him, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll what? Keep. You'll obey. You'll keep my commandments. Amen? You see, the false apostle whom Paul describes preached another Jesus, if he speaks, uh, he speaks of the same person, this is, a, this is important that you get this, and uses the same name but makes him altogether other than Paul does. Thus, another is in place. Such a Jesus would send a different spirit who would also employ a different gospel. See, an example of this is prevalent in what, I am talk <clears throat> in what I'm talking about is the counterfeit Jesus does not demand that you follow him. Just believe. Don't worry about sin or the dying to self and to its many desires. That counterfeit Jesus doesn't care about that. He just says, believe in me. I'm convinced this is one reason but I don't want to get that myself. But see, that Jesus accommodates you. Can I tell you something? The gospel was not meant to accommodate you or me. The gospel means that we accommodate, in other words, we open our hearts up to this. We line ourselves up to what God's word says, not the opposite. But too many people, if they don't like what this part of the word says, I don't accept it. But I'll run over here to the love, at the love portion at the buffet of God, and I'll just get all that and forget everything else because it's kind of unpleasant. I don't want to talk about the blood. I know Jesus did it. But that, that's, that's queasy, and we don't want to talk about that. Can I tell you something? Actually, no, I'm going to, whether you want me to or not. But I'll tell you this. The gospel's not a buffet. You receive the whole counsel of God, of God or you reject the whole counsel. What do you mean, Pastor? What I mean by that, if you don't receive the whole counsel, you're rejecting a portion of it. And in times past, when uh, people did not understand, or even before the, the, um, uh, before the second outpouring, the latter day outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the church, you look at those mainline denominations that rejected that, where they are today. They're dwindling in numbers. And if they do got a lot going on, it's simply by their own willpower and wisdom. It's not being led of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, I'm not just going to throw off on mainline denominations because the charismatic and the Pentecostal world has gone so far the other way. What they're doing is they're the spear tip on the great deception that's being played out today. And I, by the way, for those who are watching, I am a Pentecostal. I have the baptism in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gives evidence. But I'm ashamed of what purports itself as the Pentecostal theology of the day. It is a, a, it's another gospel, so to speak. I will not compromise, Lord help me. I believe that's why so many say they are Christians, but bear no fruit. You see, they have put their faith in another Jesus. We all know people right today that claim to be born again and saved, yet their life does not bear that out in any way, shape, or form. Yet they believe they're really saved. And I struggled with that for years, and I think the Holy Spirit, in fact, I don't think I know he gave me the answer to that. It's because they have put their faith in another Jesus. They really did. Those are going to be those that stand at the white throne judgment and say, Jesus, didn't we preach in your name? Didn't we do all these great things? He doesn't say, no, you never did those things. He said, depart from me because I never knew you. You, listen to this, workers of iniquity. They just didn't practice it that word workers implies they were purposely used of the enemy to thwart the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
They were enemies to Jesus. You see, they put their faith in that other Jesus. And the Jesus you follow has never transformed your life. Now, I'm not talking about you've reached perfection because there's not a one of you here, myself included, or out there that are watching that will reach perfection till we hear the sound of the trumpet and then we go up in the rapture and receive the glorified body. Is there a limit on how many times God will forgive the sincere heart? Absolutely not. And thank God for it. But listen. We need to take circumspect because if our life is no different before our profession and so and accepting of Jesus than it was afterwards, in other words, afterwards is no different than before, then you need to realize you've not put your faith in the right Jesus Christ. You've put your faith in another Jesus. And that's why you've got no power to overcome sin. That's why you don't even have a desire to change your lifestyle. Now, you may think this sounds crazy. But there, to show you where I'm t what I'm going and talking about and, and how serious this is, there's a certain segment in the church today that believes you can have multiple sex partners and you can be in a swinger. And a Charisma Magazine wrote about this, and it was like eight years ago, maybe ten now, that there was, quote, unquote, Christian swinger clubs and thought that was okay. You know what? It would be funny if it, if it actually wasn't being practiced. But I can tell you, many of the uh, uh, young adult uh, activity clubs at church and, and uh, all that, all they are is pickup places. I know from people who have told me. It's just a hookup. It's no different than going to a bar, except you're not drinking, although that's changing. In our churches, we've got some churches that actually have a bar in them now. And I'm not talking about the Catholic church. As a Catholic, I could go outside that huge, ornate church next door into the place that was added on. They spent a, over a million dollars and it's got a big bar and ballroom in it. I can remember when I became a Knights of the Columbus of the Third Order. I sat with Bishop O'Neill, the Archbishop of the Rockford Archdiocese, or the Bishop of the Rockford Archdiocese, and while he was drinking a martini and I was drinking a beer. And the only reason I did that is because drinking age in Illinois was 21 and I was only 19. But I could drink at the KC like. I was a Believer, I thought. I'd be willing to fight you to say that I wasn't a Christian. But it wasn't until I met the real Jesus Christ and got under conviction by the real Holy Spirit that I believed the real gospel. And that transformation was immediate and palatable. And, and, and I exhibited it through my life without even thinking. And from that day forward, the Lord's been taking me from grace to grace, teaching me, leading me. Oh, yes, I've had valleys just like each and every one of you, but that upward trajectory has always been this. There's been times with this, but I've constantly always going upward in Him. Amen? Amen. See, much of the charismatic world, whether through ignorance or otherwise, repudiates the cross. One of the chief proponents of that causes past miseries and the greatest defeat in the history of mankind. While they admit its necessity for salvation, some of them, they repudiate its effectiveness thereafter. I'm so tempted to say names right now, but I won't. I even heard one of them out here in Atlanta say, I'll just get that close. Mm -hmm. Who believes and even taught him on television and said, no, Jesus, where he redeemed us was in hell because he went to hell as a sinner. And that's the born again in hell theology they have, that Jesus died a sinner. They actually say he took on the nature of Satan. Can I tell you something? That is a lie from the pit of hell. Because had Jesus ever became a sinner, we would still be on our way to hell, those who put their faith and trust in Christ. Because who would have died for him? And not only that, he never ceased to be God. That would mean God literally became one with Satan. How twisted is that? Yet they're proponents of this, write about it, talk about it. And I might add, their God is money. Everything they talk about is money, money, money. Now, I'll get off my soapbox there. 
In other words, they go beyond the cross, which presents another Jesus. As well, when most Pentecostals out for humanistic psychology in place of the cross, which is the answer for all the ills of man, they are preaching another Jesus. And that's what our own denomination. We have elevated man's wisdom above the word of God, which is the only true wisdom there is in the world. My dear God, if you look at where the church of God started and where it is today, yes, we had a lot of legalism, but you saw the power of God really move. And when people didn't have any money to go to the doctor and they had brokenness in their lives through broken relationships, but when they placed it at the foot of the cross upon Mount Calvary, guess what happened? The power of God moved in their lives and people were transformed and they were lifted out of the gutter of miry clay out of the desperation of the bondages of sin into the heights of heaven itself seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's what I want to see in this home right here and this little body right here and hear about those that watch us across the internet. Because the power of God is still to the breaking of the bondages of sin and the saving of souls to the glory of the Father and Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. You see, that Jesus saves no one or delivers no one. He just doesn't. Paul, using the phrase, whom we have not preached, proclaims the fact and the truth that the Holy Spirit gave him his message. And thereby, the message of the cross. In other words, if we do not preach the gospel that Paul preached, which is Jesus Christ and him crucified, we are not preaching the gospel. So these churches that don't want to talk about the blood, don't sing about the blood, just take it completely out of their lexicon. You're presenting another Jesus that will not, cannot, and does even more importantly, does not want to save that individual. That's why if you look at these revivals, so-called, they talk about Jesus. They use his name. They use his personhood. But in reality, it's not the same Jesus. There's an individual in our church, in our uh, subdivision years ago, said, you gotta be one of those preachers, and they go to a big mega church in Woodstock as part of a bigger <coughs> network of fellowships and churches throughout the Atlanta area and then beyond even now. He said, you're one of those pastors that just preaches fire and hell and brimstone, aren't you? I said, no. I said, actually, I've only ever in 25 years of ministry preach two messages on hell itself. But what I do preach is Jesus Christ crucified and risen again. Yes. I preach the whole counsel of God. Can I tell you something? You cannot have love without the opposite. See, that's why Jesus can judge and will be the judge at the great white throne judgment because his judgment is perfect. His anger is perfect. His wrath is perfect. Just like his love is perfect. Those that go to hell today because they took their last breath, those that go tomorrow, those that go, and those that have gone in the past who are there now, it's not because God chose them to go to hell. It's there because they rejected the only way to get to him. Listen, have you ever thought God, the second member of the Trinity, became a little babe wrapped in flesh, born in a manger? And from, time, from the time at least when he was 12, he knew his sole purpose was the cross. Now, as horrifying a physical death and the beating that he incurred would have, I believe, killed every man. But see, Jesus had the power to lay his life down and he had the power to raise it again. But those 40 stripes where his ribs were exposed and his head had swelled like to this size where they had plucked his beard out and drove those thorns that was made, that crown made of thorns, the thorns were three and a half inches, and they beat it where it actually pierced his skull. Drove into the bone itself. And then the beatings he took, 
that would have killed every other man. But see, it had to be the one who would hang on the tree and shed his blood there that redeemed you and I. I shudder to think the man who will stand before God and have to give an answer as to why they presented another Jesus. It's a sobering thought. So we should examine what we believe. And this is why in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, Paul would tell the church at Corinth, 2 Corinthians 13, 5, examine yourself, whether you be in the faith. Now let me ask you something. This is Paul writing to believers, not unbelievers. Do you understand that? He said, examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. There again, it's not whether you have faith, but look at the definite article, the, the faith. There's only one faith that saves. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves. You know that word prove in the Greek literature is like what you do with uh, gold ore and silver ore. You put it through the fire to get out the impurities. And what's left is pure gold and pure silver. silver. Know not your own selves that Jesus Christ is in you except you be reprobates. In other words, he's telling the Corinthians, why are you living like what your old selves were when Christ is in you? See, the problem is, some of them had started resorting to this other Jesus, as Paul declared in Galatians. That was the big problem in the Galatian church. They were putting themselves under law, and they weren't even Jewish. They were Greek proselytes. And when I mean Greek, they were Gentiles. Now notice another spirit. Or if you receive another spirit which you have not received, tells us that the end result of another Jesus is another, <clears throat> uh, of another Jesus, if another Jesus is presented, is to, is, it is guaranteed that another spirit, excuse me, will be the result. That's the end result of another Jesus. This will be empowered by another spirit. See, this other spirit will always draw attention to himself and interact and <clears throat> instead of lifting up Christ and his finished work on the cross. which ye have not received. And pointing to reality, that what set them free from the terrible bondage of sin was the Holy Spirit of God and not another spirit. In other words, an evil spirit. Paul was pointing that to the fact, why would you receive this other spirit? Why would you receive this other Jesus? When you heard, and not only heard, but you saw the results in your own lives, what the real Jesus Christ did. And the power you now live in the power of the real Holy Spirit who is lifting you up in Christ and pointing you to Christ in all manners of your life. And when I say pointing to Christ, I mean his finished work there on the cross. But Paul's warning them, if they keep listening to these false apostles preaching another Jesus, they would find themselves back in bondage from that which they had been delivered that is a frightening prospect, is it not indeed? See, many things have come along in the past and even now present which claim to be a revival or a moving of the Holy Spirit. So I want to examine just a few of these over the last 30 years. Does anybody in the 90s remember the laughing spirit? Barking like dogs, crowing like roosters, roaring like lions, and then women going through some type of spiritual labor, literally on the floor of a church, as giving birth to revival? All those were part of the Brownsville Assembly of God in Pensacola and the Toronto Blessing and the Vineyard and around other churches in the country in, North, in the United States and, and uh, Canada, throughout North America. Then we had here, just was exposed in the last six months, but it's been around for two or three years or longer, the anointing oil, the oil flowing from the Bible. They made, those two gentlemen made a, actually I shouldn't even call them gentlemen, those two men, because gentlemen don't defraud people. But they had a whole ministry called Flowing Oil Ministry. We talked about that. That was proven that they were buying oil, at least one of the individuals, by the gallons, mineral spirits, from tra tra uh, tractor supply. And 
and you have a church who they have these big pools set up in their sanctuary and people go down in there and, and some say they've been healed and maybe they have. I don't know. If their faith was in Christ and Christ alone and his finished work at the cross, yes. But now I'm going to tell you something. This may sound very controversial. But we know who generates sickness. Do we not? It's Satan himself. Sin and disease, they're all, that's all part of the fall. That's all, all part of Satan now putting disease upon mankind. Do you think it's possible to perpetuate another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel that Satan would have, that demonic spirit release that person? so they could claim they were healed under those circumstances? I think that's a good question, and I think that's a legitimate question to ask. And I'll tell you why in a second. In just a moment. The move of the Holy Spirit will always center upon Christ's finished work on the cross. It is Jesus and what he accomplished at the cross that will always be lifted up. Never signs, never programs, formula, that doesn't work. Even the Holy Spirit himself will not take central focus in even a revival or any other part of our worship. You see, I said back years ago, that's when back in the early 90s when the whole Pensacola thing started breaking out in the church. People were flocking after signs and wonders. And I kept saying, you know what? Jesus in his own day and time said, you know what? It's an adulterous generation. He wasn't just talking about the Pharisees and the Sadducees alone. He was talking about most of the Jewish people. They were following him because of signs and wonders. Signs and wonders. Signs Follow those that believe. The, the moment you start chasing after signs, you're putting yourself on a slippery slope and making yourself a candidate to being deceived. You cannot chase after signs because the Holy Spirit, and we're going back to those re so-called revivals back then, the emphasis was on gaining power with the Holy Spirit. Go to John 16, chapter 13 and 14. I'm going to read this real quick. And I want you to look at it. This is Jesus talking now. In John's gospel, he says, How be it? In other words, he's making an emphatic statement here. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself. But whatsoever ye shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. In other words, the Holy Spirit will always present and lift up Jesus Christ. Yes, the Holy Spirit is fully God. But he receives his adoration, his praise and worship, vicariously, so to speak, through the worship of the Father and the Son. Nowhere in the New Testament or the Old do we worship the Holy Spirit directly. You do not find that. We don't even address the Holy Spirit directly. You don't find that in any of Paul's writings. Look at it yourself. In fact, Jesus himself said, when you pray, pray like this. Pray to the Father in my name. That's what Jesus told us. He didn't say pray directly to the Holy Spirit because when you do that, this is why. You're praising the Father and praying because all good gifts come from the Father of lights is what the Bible declares from above. And the Father will dispense those good gifts to those who know him and love him through his Son because it's the Son that bridged the gap that made a way for you and I now to be in the family of God. It was Jesus Christ who became flesh and walked up that hill called Calvary some 2,000 years ago. An emaciated figure. In fact, the Bible says you couldn't even, couldn't even recognize him as a man. That 
That's why the Holy Spirit will only work in the parameters. Listen to me closely. He only works in the parameters of the finished work of Christ on that cross. Jesus is always the source of everything you have need of. Think about that. Salvation to the lost, and after that, for everything you have need of in this life, for godliness is provided for what Christ did on the cross. And the Holy Spirit will not work out outside of that. In other words, if you think by fasting and praying hours a day or doing any other thing in and of itself will give you victory over that which you so desire in your heart, you will miss it and never attain it because the Holy Spirit will not honor your effort in praying to receive something from God as far as, and what I mean by that, because I pray, I merit something. No, we pray because we have a relationship with the Father and His desire is to give us those things that Jesus Christ already purchased for you. How many remember the Daniel fast that went through the whole, and some churches still did that? Who participated in it? Was there any lasting effect out of that? Not if your faith was in the fact that you fasted. God, you saw what I've done. Now I know because what I've done, because you know my sincerity and my love for you, you're going to move. That becomes a wage. You cannot earn by doing work your salvation as a sinner, and you cannot earn by doing any type. Those things are good enough themselves if they're in the right place. Prayer, fasting, reading your Bible. But the moment you say it, because God, you know my heart, and you can be the sincere person you want, you can be reading and, and all this, and somehow you think, because I'm drawing closer to God now, God's going to get do that what I so pray for in my life, in the life of my family, or whatever it is, my finances, marriage, children, whatever. God will not answer that prayer. That's why Paul said, you frustrate the grace of God, because here's what happens. The moment you say, God, I've done this, therefore, you're going to, Give what I need because I've done something for you. And you're proud of me. The Holy Spirit stands back here in the believer's life and does not do anything. That's frustrating the grace of God. You say, Pastor, how can you say that? Well, I can say it like this. <clears throat> if you, the believer, are still struggling with any type of issue and sin in your life, you don't have the victory. I'm not talking about sinless perfection. Because that won't happen until you get the glorified body. But people who struggle and are still struggling with the same sinful tendency, and it doesn't have to be the big five. It could be hate. It could be malice. It could be unforgiveness. It could be slander. It could be gossip, whatever it is. And you haven't found victory. It's because your, vic your faith is not placed in the right object. And that object is Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. You see, Christ is always the source. But the only way you tap into that source for victory is through the cross. It's the means by which he dispenses the victory that you and I so desperately need. You see, to the sinner, they have no problem putting their faith completely, totally, in what Christ did on the cross to save them. It's when we become saved that somehow we've been sold a bill of goods. Okay, you're saved, now you've got to live it. Where's the emphasis now? The emphasis is on me telling you why. I'm going to move on, but I want to say this. The only thing incumbent upon the believer, the only thing, and it's not a work, but it's saying, Jesus, I want your will to swallow up my will. Yeah. See, that's faith. That's not a work. Because you can't force God to swallow something that you won't freely give him. You can't force God for anything. But the moment you say, you know, Lord, you said, I've got to be holy for Jesus, for you are holy. And literally, holy means set apart. So how do I live a life set apart when I don't even have the power within me, even as a believer, even as a believer baptized in the Holy Spirit? with the evidence speaking on their tongues. That's not in and of itself the power. What happens then is you've got the potential, but the Holy Spirit only brings that potential to bear in your life when you keep your faith and trust 
completely, just like you did as a sinner, upon salvation, salva, uh, uh, saving faith, you keep that same faith that God, you desire, you command that I follow you. But I know I can't, but that's okay, because Jesus, you already have done it for me. I trust you to now do it in my life. And you will find that the power of God so working in your life. Things that you struggle with all your life will suddenly start to fall. You know why? Because it's the Holy Spirit's business to make you a vessel set aside for God. I'll quickly bring this to an end. Finally, the result of preaching another Jesus and another spirit is another gospel. And I want to say this before I get out of here, before I get out off of this issue right here. But I want to say this. When I was talking about these false manifestations of another spirit, one of the false teachings that the Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit, this is a false teaching, uses a point of contact, quote unquote, and it's many different things. Prayer cloths, this oil, making sure you get to this baptismal school. The only point of contact, the only point of contact that God honors is your faith reaching up and grabbing hold of the work Christ did for you on the cross. That's the point of contact that changes a life. Now, I know there's out there who will say, well, what about the prayer cloth? Paul used one. You know what? The point of contact wasn't so much the cloth. It was still their faith in the Christ that Paul preached. That was the point of contact. In the Old Testament, you didn't have the Holy Spirit living in you. Christ had not gone to the cross and paid the terrible sin debt that lay over each and every human being on this earth since Adam and Eve. But since then, what can I do? Where can I go? Paul says we can now enter boldly into the throne room of God. Not a high priest. What made that possible is that point of contact called Calvary. When Jesus Christ said, it is finished. When your faith is there, mountains move. Amen? That's your point of contact. So another gospel which you have not accepted means that the gospel that first came to you to set you free, if you revert to the other gospel, you will be back in to bondage. The true gospel of Jesus Christ, Christ which is the message of the cross, gets people saved, lives changed, bondages broken, sick bodies healed, and believers baptized with the Holy Spirit. Any ministry that does not line up with the book of Acts and the epistles is not a ministry that the Holy Spirit will anoint. You can sit there and take umbrage with that all you want. You can take me to churches that have big things and they're sending people around the globe and they're doing all kinds of things. But if it's not centered upon the real Jesus Christ, that's not the Holy Spirit's doing it. That's why I'm not saying these pastors are all false teachers. Because those will be ones that will stand there and when they're receiving their crowns, they're receiving their reward. Remember, it's tried by fire. What's the fire? It's the word of God. Okay, stubble. We'll all be burned up. And wood. We'll all be burned up. I don't ever want my ministry to center upon what I can see with the eye. And that's always a challenge because I'm a human being just like everybody else. Do I get down when the church doesn't fill up? Sometimes if I was to look at that on a regular basis, I'd be down all the time. Even today, there's those that I thought would be here and they're not. But my responsibility it's twofold. First, it's to the one who called me to be faithful. Second, it is to be an under-shepherd, and that means faithful to you. 
And you know what? I've settled that in my heart. That's good enough for me. If that's all the, the platitudes, if that's all the thankfulness I get, I'm good with that. Because first and foremost, like I said, I want to be faithful to him who called me, counted me worthy, not worthy of myself, but worthy in his great plan to place me in the ministry. Amen? Amen. And that can be down, taken down to your level too. Be satisfied with where God, what God is doing in your life. And don't move away from that until you're led completely by the Holy Spirit. He said God's word must always be, can I have you come up here? Where is uh, my music minister? Here you go. God's word must always be the litmus test by which all ministry is to be proved. You might, well, you might well bear with him. Paul is in effect saying to the Corinthians, he comes and preaches another Jesus whom we did not preach to you. And he's saying this, he goes, you know that it is not the same Jesus. So what did you do? Did you avoid the false teacher? No, he said. You tolerated him by the words, well, did you bear him? You see, bring him and stand with me today and bring this to a close right now. These false apostles were offering a different picture of Jesus as he lived and walked on earth. Most likely a Judaistic picture which emphasized the Judaism of Jesus and him keeping the law in a false way. In other words, they did not understand he did it for us because we couldn't keep the law for ourselves. No man can or could or has or ever will. So how is, how is it unlike what we see today, today, Jesus that is presented is not the Jesus that the Bible has revealed. Notice from Jesus, Paul advances to the spirit and then to the gospel. Because it is the spirit through whom Jesus works among men, men and women. And because it is the gospel then by the means of which the spirit does the work. So these three, Jesus, the spirit, and the gospel occur in their natural and proper order. So remember the false apostles whom Paul describes, preach another Jesus. There again, they speak of the same person and use the same name, but make him altogether other than Paul does. Thus, another is in his place. Such a Jesus sends a different spirit who employs a different gospel. There's some of us here today that have family members or in these churches that are preaching another Jesus that's anointed by another spirit which presents another gospel. We need to lift them up in prayer. Take that serious. Some of you know in your heart of hearts that what they're in and where they're at is wrong. And I'm going to tell you something. Family is the hardest to witness to. You know why they see all your flaws? You don't see all my flaws. Although there's very few. You've got to really get a magnifying <laughs> You want one? Just ask her. Because she can bring them all to the surface real quick. Many of you know uh, he's my best friend in ministry. My best friend, period. Bill Flynn. And... Uh, Oh, they've been married probably about 20 years. And he was on the state board of the, the five New England states, as well as pastoring the biggest church in Maine. As they were going to one of the state functions, or the five state functions, that he was going to be the keynote speaker. They'd gotten an argument. Who's never gotten an argument going to somewhere to do something for God? <laughs> and he looked at Maddie and said, Maddie, just tell me what's wrong with me. He said, she didn't let up for two and a half hours. <laughs> and he said, the truth of it was, she was mostly right. And he said, now go up and preach to 1,500 people. He said, I felt like I had to drag myself up the platform. He felt like he was about this high. And somehow it came out of the message. He, he relayed what happened, but said, you know what? Thank God for a godly wife. Wasn't he was off in some sin? wasn't that at all. He just like most of us at times was not being led by the Holy Spirit, but by our own spirit and act.
causes problems, does it not? I know what he meant. Because I can tell you, we, would, we lived two and a half miles from a church we attended in almost 10 years. We could get up, and I love you, honey, baby, it was great. We had a great date night last night, two and a half hours, we were looking for divorce attorneys. I mean, two and a half miles, not two and a half hours. And I thought when I got called, finally, I was called early on in my Christian life. And when I finally yielded to that call to go into the ministry, I thought, well, we'll be beyond that. No. I can remember one of them knocked down, drag out pipe, and she didn't want to go in the church, and I had to go in there and say, Praise the Lord! Don't you love Jesus? <laughs> but you know what was great? By the end of the service, we were knitted back together. Because that's what God does. So, I don't know why I'm saying this. Maybe it's for some of you here. Don't let the enemy disrupt you. No, he's going to attack you anytime, even on Sunday morning, especially Sunday morning. But anything you're going to do for God, he is going to attack you. Amen. You're laughing because you've been there, haven't you? It's all in Ellen's fault, right? Yes. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I love each and every one of you. Go in the fear and admonition of the Lord. But remember, anything that's taught to you, even if I teach it, you compare it to the Word of God. Because I'm not perfect. I might get, I might, I might get lost. I might miss it. I might be following my own spirit. Love me enough that you would challenge me on that. Amen. Because I love you enough, I'll challenge you on it. I know I made some mad. I haven't seen him back here since then. But not because I wanted to be in their face or rob them. It's because as a pastor, as an under shepherd, that's what a pastor is. I'm mandated by God to give the word and guard the flock. And if I don't, and if you're one of the sheep that he's put me and as a shepherd to shepherd you, not over you, not to browbeat you, so to speak, not to tell you where you can go, what you can do. That's not the, that's not the, the job of the shepherd. The job of the shepherd is to keep the wolves at bay and feed you or lead you into green pastures where you get fed. And those green pastures is the unadulterated word of Amen? Amen? So let's go, and each one of you, like I said, has got family members or friends. Lift them up. Take them before the Lord in prayer. And God will move in their behalf. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you for this opportunity to preach your word and to minister and just proclaim the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that everyone here and those who have watched through the internet, that you bless their day today, bless their going in, or going out, bless their coming in, bless them with their families, just let them feel the presence and power and love of Jesus Christ. And Father, we thank you and praise you for this, in Christ's lovely name, and the church said, Amen. 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 You're dismissed. Take it away, brother. Yeah. I love our little jam sessions at the end of the service. Come up here, let's jam together.
all you do. I really do.